Welcome to the SE Podcast. I am your host, Justin McRoberts. This is also your host, producer Dan Portnoy. Uh, we are doing a series uh, in which and by which we're digging back into and through the book Sacred Strides, going chapter by chapter, talking about the dominant themes in the book or uh, extras on top of the book, what, you know, what it looks like to apply some of the things that I get to in the book. Dan, who's been a friend for a long time and has produced this podcast from its uh, beginning has a really unique uh, perspective on my work and on me as a worker, and so it's fun to talk about talk about my stuff and and have Dan poke around a little bit at hey what's behind this or what's underneath this or what's after this, and so um, we've enjoyed doing this podcast series up to this point. We expect to continue to, and we think you are as well, judging by the the numbers, the metrics. Uh, so this is chapter two of the book Sacred Strides, uh, and will you please welcome Dan Portnoy? to the microphone let's uh let's dig in okay well uh justin thanks for having me uh again yeah. for the the third time here um so chapter two we're talking about a false start or take your kid yes. to work day uh which is a funny thing and if i may jump to kind of the end we're talking about identity yes we're talking about identity um in this yep. chapter um, the, now you you do a great job. Like this chapter is real fun because you're generationally you're you're kind of holding hands to yeah. my dad and my kid, and that's what this yep. chapter is about, um, which is, is real fun. Not to uh, spoiler alert, Snape kills Dumbledore. That's fine. But um, anyway, um, <laughs> so um, yeah. ship sinks, girl lives. Yeah, she becomes a mermaid. I don't know. Um, no, she throws she, a jewel away. Yeah, something oh, inexplicable. Right. Yes. Why would you do that? Um, anyway, so uh, I wonder if you might just kind of give us a, a little rundown of maybe the first story uh, with your dad. Um, just kind of yeah. like walk, walk us through that story, uh, because I think sure. it is very indicative of, of some identity issues that I think we as artists all deal with. Um, and yes. I think and, and obviously your dad. Um, yeah. dealt with as in, in his creative space. And I always think it's interesting to like view your your folks as artists. I think that like oh, in, in, a, yeah. in a creative yeah, way, yeah. like my parent, like especially if they are entrepreneurial and they, they are doing uh, something, uh, they're running their yeah. own business or that is a very creative endeavor. And to think of your, yes. think of them as artists and thinking of them as uh, in my own way, I always think of the, the, the waves like, the creation, mm. the launch, and as the launch yes. happens, and kind of my attitude craps out usually right yeah. away, um, yes. and and just yeah. like and I have to make sure I'm like doing what's the next thing so I don't like yep. sit there and stare at the abyss and uh, yeah. and be like, am, am I what am I even doing? Um, yeah, kind of thing. So I wonder if you could just kind of give us a rundown of 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 the story. Yeah, actually, really, I hadn't thought about it and. In- that directly, but I like the idea. I mean, I've, I've probably said things like this to, p- to people about pr- parenting and, and art. In fact, I think I, you might remember this. The, the one of the first times I, I did a, a book like this, I did a book we, that I ended up calling title pending, <laughs> which is such a terrible uh, idea for the SEO. And um, <laughs> yes, just, but also it is disaster. really great, but you're right. It's terrible. It's, it's, it's on a great, the SEO it's a front, title. Really the SEO bad. was like, what? Who are you? <laughs> um, but in that book, I, I talk about parenting, uh, like reapproaching parenting with a more creative mindset and thinking about like, it's a place where we get to be, think creatively and thinking about parenting more like an art. Uh, it lets it be about process and relearning and self-examination as opposed to just execution. And you and I both being dads, it's like, man, it's, it is, it, it can feel like a bit of a trap to like, I just want to execute. I want to nail it. I want to pin it. I want to do it right. Uh, but it really is, if I'm honest and if I'm in my right mind, it really is more like an art. And um, in the, again, in the Seth Godin sense, like I'm, it's, it's art if you can say, this is going to work, and this is not going to work, and mean both things at the exact same time. And so, um, yeah, my dad as an artist, uh, and at this point in his, in his work and career, not just in his relationship with me, in that artistic sense, he was starting a business of his own. He'd been working in the travel industry for a long, long time. Navy guy, uh, left the Navy to enter into the travel industry, worked in the travel industry, and just he's a, he was such a clever and insightful person, um, great in conversation, highly relational, 
and he could he could look around at like a system he was working in or a group he was working in. He was just great at connecting and making things work and making things better. Probably a maximizer. Um, and he had this idea um, of basically doing something like um, like kayak does, where it was like a it was an aggregate that instead of like making seventeen phone calls to different airlines about these packages and getting from here. He was like, what if we, ag- what if we, what if we became like an aggregate and doing sort of this travel, travel agency thing. This is long before the internet that you, you could call this one centralized place and they could, they could connect you with different travel agencies and, or different airlines. They were doing all the research. Great, cool idea. It hadn't been done at least on our, you know, local world before. And, uh, but he was, because he was starting it, um, like happens because he was starting this thing that had not been done before by folks he knew he was doing it on his own. So he brought me, he brought me in to work with him and it was his office downtown Concord um, on Grant street. And um, the scene that I remember, I remember being there a few times. I worked with my dad off and on for a while, but the scene in the, in this chapter um, there's no office furniture at all. It's literally just like empty space. I'm on the floor and he's giving me a bunch of envelopes. I think my dad's in the next room, like trying to put the phone line in the wall, like literally doing like, again, this is so art, right? It's like, you know, you have to do everything. You was like, I thought you're making a record. What does it have to do with learning to wire like a whole room? Yeah. You have no idea. Um, so he's doing everything. I'm helping him with the everything by, by stuffing envelopes and the envelopes were going to go out to travel agencies and airlines basically to announce like, Hey, this is the thing I'm doing. This is what, this is what the plan is. We'd like to have you involved. Very professional letter. And he hands it off to me at like in my childhood. And I'm on the ground stuffing these envelopes and grabbing stamps and just, and it's before the adhesive stamps. <laughs> it's like apparently before roads too. And I'm licking stamps and stick them on. And I'm just going as fast as I can. Cause I just want to get it done. And my dad comes into the room where I'm working and sees that the stamps are like kind of crooked, crackered all over the place. Some of the envelopes a little look a little lumpy because I've I've not stuffed them very gently. I've like kind of crunched them in there. So it looks like a kid did it because a kid did it. And he freaks out. Um, and I like I'd seen my dad get angry before. I mean, I have a few scenes in my mind. Um, from childhood where when he got, when he got mad, it was bad. Like he wasn't like an overall like angry person all the time, but when he did, it was terrifying. And this was one of those moments, uh, where he got really mad and took all the envelopes away from me and like, didn't explain it. Didn't say anything to me outside of just like, it can't be, they said, damn it, it can't be this messy. And like took them all away and started over and just, and that's the last thing I remember in the scene is him, like from my memory, is him taking these all away on his hands and knees, like undoing envelopes. And um, that that's one of the scenes that sticks in my mind because I got dis- I want, I disappointed my dad. Like, like I, bl- I knew I had blown, I'm, I wasn't stupid. Like I just, I got distracted. I don't know. Like I was just being a dumb kid. But I knew in the moment, like I had dropped, I had seriously dropped the ball on my dad. Now I didn't get at the time, like the weight of the thing. I didn't because I didn't. Under, I knew. I know now uh, that like what he was doing was really important. So the way I write on the book is I say, um, within a few moments of my of my trying to help, uh, he had swept my entire pile into his, mumbling, "Just give me those, and I'll do it." And then I write this. He wasn't mad, not really. He was scared. And I'm very much like him in this way where like when I get, most of the time if I find myself like super pissed, it's because I'm scared. And that's how my fear manifests itself is ang- fear feels like, fear for me feels like, like I'm going to get victimized. I'm going to get hurt and it feels defensive. Anger makes it feel like, and it's not a bad thing, but anger makes me feel like I can go do something about it. It's my subconscious mind saying, let's fix it. Um, he wasn't mad, not really, he was scared. And while I didn't recognize what was happening at the time, I now know that my dad was terrified of what would happen if his business failed. That fear, not only still a moment he and I might have shared, a moment uh, 
etc. But eventually that fear would steal from him the joy of work and of life itself. Like he he had started this business. It was he was taking a massive risk betting on himself that he could execute this really cool idea. And he had handed this like sliver of his work life to me. And the reality is, I mean, it is true. Like had the business failed, it could have meant disaster. Like this was how we were paying for life. This was it. It was my dad's job. So if it didn't go well, one, like who knows if you can go get another job. The market was very different at the time. And two, like once you failed at a business, now you're the guy who failed at a business and do people hire him? Who knows? So he was terrified. Um, and that stuck with me, the, like the fear of like how delicate it feels to do important things. Like if I'm doing something important and it's tied to my livelihood it's, or it's tied to my identity, I have the propensity, just like my dad, to get really, really nervous about it going well. Uh, so that's how this chapter starts. It's like tying in, like I, I want to, I, I want readers to identify to to see themselves here. Like when you go to do like important stuff, that that fear of this thing failing, that's gonna pop up. That's gonna be real when you do important work or work you care about, especially if it's closer to your identity. Man, it it can be terrifying. It it should be in a way, but it definitely is. Yeah, I think that that fear anger situation. I think that's very very uh, prevalent. Also for me is like because anger is that secondary emotion. It yep. just it's so quick though that it just feels like <laughs> anger. It's so quick because yep. we run past that fear so fast. Um, well, because my like I don't want like my like I don't want to feel afraid. No, I would rather feel anger, and so my anger is a it's a good, it's a defense mechanism against my own emotions. Like I would rather be mad and project it onto the world around me or to my kid. Right. Then like actually deal with the fear in me that has to do with my insecurities. Like what if my plan sucks or what if I'm, what if I'm doing like, I don't want to do that. And so then I'd rather also be, be vulnerable to, to your kid at the same then, time. Yep. Oh, exactly. My. So I'd rather be pissed because it helped that I can push that outward. Mm -hmm. Fear pushes me inward where I have to deal with like, maybe I'm scared because I'm not so sure of my own self or my own identity or my own plan. Yeah. Especially rolling the dice like this, like, Especially like, was it which late, I'm doing late all, 80s? Which I'm doing. Oh, dude, uh, this late would have 80s? been no. Th this is before late eighties. This is like a early eighties. I would oh, have wow. been. Uh, let's see. So I was born in seventy four, so mid eighties. Yeah, yeah, mid eighties. Yeah, mid eighties. Yeah, that's just that's crazy to think that because Priceline Kayak didn't even that what's what's that late nineties? Yeah, before there was that no, really there was no. In? This is before the internet. That's just this so is, wild. It was such a cool, it, it and that's the other idea. thing about big ideas too, right? Like when you have a really good idea, and you know it's a really good idea, mm -hmm. the pressure to right. execute on the idea because it's such a good idea. Yeah, it's part of it's part of what I experience anger too. It's especially, like, this is a really especially good idea. if your talent is not equal to the task. That's 100%. The, the brutal thing, which is almost always the case. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm well, not but that's how. You, yeah, exactly. But that's how you get better, right? So that's how you get better. Yeah. Is you make big plans and try. Right. So I like what you write here. The, this quote of uh, my dad wasn't taught that his strengths and talents were gifts given him uh, by a God who'd made him that way in love. They were just tools yeah. intended to help him achieve specific ends, namely fending off poverty and financially providing for those he was responsible for. And how yeah. much like I, I don't do well on this uh, perspective as well, because I'm huh. just like I'm like the might of my right arm kind of thing. I will drag yeah. everyone to finish the project I'm working on. And I don't often mm. think about like, I was given this talent. I was, I was made this way or, uh, yeah. so, so what do you, what do you say to artists as they're, they're doing that struggle? How do we get that perspective? Um, uh, I've said or this, I think it. a couple of times on this, um, on the, in this series, um, you have to fail at something you want to do. Uh, it's part of it's part of the journey is you have to fail at something you want to go well. Um, that's it's um, it's like a necessary ingredient um, because um, in in the rubble, <laughs> it's not always rubble, but in the aftermath, if I do well, what I what I hopefully discover is that like the the real urgency. Um, the real urgency is not that I want to do the project. The real urgency is that I want to be the kind of person who does this project. 
It's always a question of identity. And I have to become disillusioned with or fail at a project in order to see myself. It's like the only way I've ever got. The art egos are just specifically for folks who, who have big, cool ideas. If you've got really big, cool ideas, then you're going to get lost in your big, cool idea. It's just going to happen. And the only way to eventually discover yourself as the thing that's really interesting to you is you have to fail at a really big, cool idea and then try to start another one because the, what you eventually learn is like, it's not that I want to be, it's not that I want to accomplish the task. It's that I want to be the kind of person who accomplished this, who, who accomplishes the task. And I mean, it's like, I, it's not that I want to run 26 miles as if 26 miles means anything. It's that I, I want to be someone who can run 26 miles. It's always a question of identity. And we can only really get to that by failing and then doing the process work afterwards. Hmm. Now, well, what Specifically about, doing the process work afterwards. Yeah, because I think that the thing that I always uh, try to try to think more about is that it's not so much the result because the result I can't control as much. And just, yes. the, but the, how am I pushing the rock up the hill and yes. falling in love with how do I push the rock up the hill, um, yeah. <laughs> which sucks, but that that has to be the thing that I think about more than how it's going to result also because sometimes if I think about the end, I do get paralyzed because yes. I do, you know, if I'm writing a book and I'm, I'm like, this is it, this is going to be, this is my pilot. This is my book. This is going to be, yeah. this is going to be a big seller. And then all of a sudden it's like, I don't know what to write next and I'm done yes. uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm basking in a glory that doesn't even exist. Um, trying to, to getting push caught up, getting, getting caught up in the end makes the makes it's, it's not just, you know, it's just steals the joy of the journey. That's true. It does steal the joy of the journey. And I would suggest um, that because when it steals the joy of the journey, it makes the ending lesser anyways. Because mm -hmm. uh, if, if I'm not working in joy, oh, I have a story I want to tell. I'm, if I'm not working in joy, then the end product will, will be a reflection of anxiousness and execution. And that's cool, but it won't be a reflection of identity and joy and passion. We watched, uh, as a family, we watched Ace Ventura the other night. <laughs> um, I don't know when the last time it, you saw this it, that it's film. It's been a long while, yeah. Bro, it is so <laughs> in the middle of the movie, Asa, who's who's 13, he goes, Boy, they had a good time making this movie. And I was like, and this the plot is a disaster. Like mm -hmm. it's like the yeah. plot of the film is right. just like if you stop and I'm like, why? Like, what is then Dan Marino's in the film and right. like his character is so odd, it's like, wait. Why doesn't he there are all these massive holes mm -hmm. in the story and all these like weird scene like cut scenes from here to over here? It's like I thought we were over here and like the editing's not that great, some of the audio's not but they are having such a good time and Jim Carrey is having the best time just goofing off and being this character. And that's what makes the movie great, is like the fun of having made the movie. And I think that ends up being true of really great work in the long run is like, was there joy in the process? And, and that like it, the joy in the process really does lead to like m more whole, deeper, better execution, as opposed to just trying to get it done at the cost of the joy. But I thought about it watching that film. I was like, what makes this movie great is how much fun they had making it. I want my work to, to feel that way in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny. A lot of his movies, they do those outtakes at the end, like Liar, Liar, and it's it's so good <laughs> when they're just it's like so riffing and, and just everybody's just like... Totally. Hyster I, my favorite is always when actors are doing their thing and the crew is always busting up behind the, the yes. camera and you can just hear them like howling. and Yeah, having a great so time. So good, so good. Um, I think the, the one of the things I also like is, 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 one of the, is your quote here that you say, I think the question just beneath the surface of what must I do to be successful? That thing that we're always thinking about, that, that yes. end in mind kind of idea. What must I do to become famous? Which is uh, obviously a question I deal with a lot more um, out here maybe than your, your average uh, uh, person. Yeah. Or what must I do to, in order to fit in and be attractive? Uh, is always what's, what must I do to be loved? And I, I guess I, I didn't think of so much of it like, and it, it's who am I trying to be loved by? Like just a general audience mm. or just a yes. general like people like that's just it's kind yeah. of and when i think about it like that i'm like ooh, i don't like that i don't i don't like that so much at <laughs> right. all like because then i'm just like please put love in this this thing sir you know like yes. as opposed to like to no, no, i'm trying to i'm striving to get i'm not trying to make money i'm trying to get booked and i'm trying to you know like yes. that sounds awesome as opposed to like please love me yeah 
Well, so one of the things I'll do, one of the, one of the things I'll do specifically with artists I get to work with is, um, because I believe that like that's the question at the heart of our work is like is love me as I want to I do what I do because I want to be loved and accepted. I think that's hundred percent true. I will ask folks to make lists of specific people. So like you want to write a book, you want to do a record, you want to put together a series of paintings or poems or whatever. And then we start talking about audience, especially for folks who are like brand new at the game. Um, what I will, have, I will have folks do is I want you to imagine your audience. Like think about, think about who this book is going to be, you know, who, the, who this book, let's talk about books, who this book of poems is going to, you know, whose hands these are in. And I want you to like, let your brain like gravitate towards specifics that if, if this sold 17 copies, like what 17 people, <laughs> like, would you be stoked that, you know, had it like, because I, I think our hearts, I, I, I know our hearts really attach themselves to specifics, to particular people. And like, we've been there, right? It's the loneliness of art is like, if for even successful artists, financially su successful artists who end up feeling some level, some degree of disappointment, like, was there, like, who do you wish like benefited from this? Give me a name because that's going to actually, that's actually what propels me is I want to affect a person's life. I want to, I want to be attached to someone. That's the love, that's the, the love connection. That's the actual connection that my art is wanting to forge. It's what my soul's wanting to do is I want to forge a connection between, between myself and someone else. Give me a specific. I think that's super important because it, I don't want to ask that of uh, people on Instagram. Uh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to ask the internet. I don't want to like ask the TikToks or whatever, like, please affirm me. But I do want certain people for sure to really love what I do. Uh, I want to feel loved and valued and appreciated and seen. And that comes from really specific names. So I have my artist, artist clients do that regularly. It's like, give me some names because we chase, we chase that. We chase that connection. I want to be loved. There's a tale that I, I told the story recently. It's not really my story to tell this anecdote. Did you, you saw the movie, um, the social network? Yeah. I love that movie. Um, on multiple levels. I love the soundtrack. It's great. I love, Trump oh, yeah, Lightner, yeah, but, um, so it. the, it opens up, you know, the whole thing with Zuckerberg and his, and his girlfriend and it's, it begins with their breakup. Mm -hmm. And ultimately the, the whole movie ends up basically being about him really wanting and wishing he had her attention. And there are these two key moments for me in the film. And if you haven't seen the film, it's old. And I'm, if I blow it for you, that's too bad. You should have seen it already. So the one is like, it begins with him breaking up with the girl, which, okay, this is a great, great opening scene. It's like a great opening scene. She's fantastic in that role. Then about midway through the film, he's building Facebook, but it's on, I think it's just on the Harvard campus and like maybe one other school, something like this. And he runs into her at a bar and he goes over to have a conversation with her. And he wants her to step aside. And she's like, I'm here with my friends, which is such a great insult. <laughs> it's so good. She's so good in the role. And he starts telling her about this thing he's doing. He's like telling her about Facebook. He's building Facebook. And she blows him off. She's, and she tells him like, have a good time with your video game. <laughs> Which wow. Is so good. Such a great line. I love that moment because then the next thing he does is he takes that back to the to at, well, at that time the offices of Facebook, which were his dorm, and he's like, "We need to expand." Like that's when he decides that they they want to go to the, these other schools, and it's when um, what's his scratch says that's you know we need to go to Stanford. Like he he his propulsion for building the thing was he wanted her to be impressed by it. Now, whether this is true in history, in, act, in Zuckerberg's actual life, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. uh, but I love that as a character moment. And then the fact that the, the, at the very tail end of the film, the way the movie ends is he's sitting in the offices, the, the lawyer's offices. He's being sued by all these people, including his best friend. Everything's falling apart around him. He's giving away millions of dollars. His name's getting thrown around. He's the bad guy on all these people's lists. And he asks to borrow one of the lawyer's computers cracks it open, logs into Facebook and goes to his ex-girlfriend's Facebook profile, submits a friend request and just starts hitting refresh. 
to see if she's there. Right. And that's how the movie ends. I think even when we build our biggest, baddest, coolest stuff that in the in our heart of hearts we do the things we do because we want because we want to put our best in the world as person. This is me. This is the best of me. And we want someone to say who you are is awesome. I love mm. it. And for him it was her. He wanted her. He's building I mean he revolutionized the freaking internet. He changed everything. It's still the biggest thing online. It's still like the reference point for all social media is still Facebook. He changed everything. And at the end of the movie, at least in character, the thing that mattered most to him is, does this girl think that what he did was cool? Oh, right. it's so good. Right. I think that's true of us. And so having the specific names, it's always about who I am. And because it's about who I am, I want someone to tell me that I'm good. That's why we make art. Right, but how do we how do we disentangle ourselves or is is that a good motivator? Like I don't know. I think it's it, a great is, motivator. Okay. I so just think it, it matters the, the the question ends up being who. Right. Like but who? I think like who, but it also who, sounds really attention? dangerous. Super is. All relationship yeah. is dangerous. <laughs> this yeah. is the danger of relationship, it's the danger of art, it's the danger of community, it's the danger of being alive. Is you put yourself out there, you hope to be loved and the ch and and the the there is no guarantee that the answer is yes. You go to ask the person out to prom and the thrill of the thing is like they might say no. Mm. And so when you get that yes, it's like, oh my gosh, you love me. That never goes away. Mm -hmm. It's always true. We'll be in our 70s and we'll be like putting the best that we have out in the world and hoping our grandkids like it. It's, it'll, be, it'll be that. It's always, about, it's always about who I am and who I am is always about relationship and relationship is always about risk every single time. So all that to say, picking who, choosing who our who is um, really matters, which is you got to it a minute ago. It's what's so freaking dangerous about just talking about your audience. Mm -hmm. If it's just this blank, like faceless group of numbers on your, uh, you know, on your uh, yeah, social media hearts. platform, yeah. you're screwed. If yeah. that's, if those, if that's the attention you're chasing, bro, they don't love you. <laughs> they yeah. don't love you and they never will. never will, but someone probably will. So pick that person and go chase them and make art for them. Sure. Sure. But what if you make art for you or you tell people You're to make art for you? <laughs> I think it's, a, I think it, so, I, and this is where I actually differ from a lot of people. I don't buy that thing. The whole, like I do it for me thing. I just don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. I think that's a weird defense mechanism mm -hmm. uh, because it's so scary to say like, I want someone to love me. Mm -hmm. Well, it's okay. It's I want me to love me. Yeah, uh -huh. man. I don't know. I, I I go back and forth about that. Like I I get that. I just don't think I really fully buy it. Mm -hmm. I think at the end of I think at the end of my life, if I'm the only person that was happy with who I am, I I think I might feel pretty freaking lonely. I yeah. I need other people. I'm designed for other people. So I don't buy the whole make art for art's sake thing. No, I don't buy the whole I do things for myself and it doesn't matter what other people think thing. Uh -uh. I don't really buy it. I think picking and choosing whose attention change it, whose attention we, ah, picking and choosing whose attention and care we grant ourselves access to or we grant access to our hearts from, like that's the ball game. Knowing who we want to love us and forging that relationship, I think that's it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, if we transition then to the, your second story in uh, in the chapter, you you start talking about uh, a time where you're now working with Asa. Um, can you yeah. kind of give us this rundown? Yeah. So um, it's the sort of in the earlier in the chapter um, when I'm, I'm so as I've as I've reimagined that day with my dad. You know, we, you do the thing you do after arguments with people it's like you kind of reconstruct the scene like i should have said this like if i would have only singer. said this that's a good singer yeah uh i've done that with that scene and it's never like i wish i would said something back to my dad what i wished is that instead of just getting mad and taking the envelopes from me that he would have stopped and said okay here listen i'm this makes me upset and let me tell you why because professionalism and appearance and and like care communicates to people and it makes people feel like you're taking them seriously. Like he could have taken the moment 
to teach me something about being a man, being a worker, being an adult. But he was so hurt and, and scared that he didn't. So I say in the book, like we never get those moments back. Um, but we do oftentimes get opportunities to reconstruct them in real time in different settings. So this was that for me. My son started playing music um, a long time ago. Actually, when he was three, he started playing drums a little bit and farting around with songs. And over the uh, COVID era, I don't know if you remember that there was this um, thing. No, no. What COVID. happened? Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a, well, I don't know what, now, what now we're really asking. <laughs> we don't really know. Um, what did happen? Maybe we won't do that. There was podcast. a supervillain. So, he ate a bat. Then there was a spread. It was a lot like know. that. Yeah. It was a lot like that actually. Yeah. <laughs> so over like while shutdown was happening and he couldn't go to school and I wasn't traveling, like we were in the house a bunch and we started playing a lot of music together. And he's like, he's got a lot of musical ability and he's got a great sense of melody. So we were farting around with stuff. And I was like, I really like what you're doing. So we like, I got my phone out and started recording some of the stuff we did. And I just threw it out. Like I was serious when I said it, I was like, buddy, we should record some of these songs. He was like, yeah, that'd be great. You know, he's 10 or 11 at the time. Um, and, but I was dead serious. So I actually booked studio time. So I told him like, Hey, here's the, you were going to go, you were going to go to uh, Masaki's at one way studio and do, you know, do this recording. He was like, okay, cool. So I took him out of school early on a uh, Friday and we drove out to, to one way and on the drive out, it was like exciting and fun. And we were listening to the, our recordings on the phone, kind of talking about the parts of the song. And then once we got in front of the studio, like it's sort of, I think it sank in for him. Like, Oh shit, this is real. We're going to go in here. And he got really nervous and wouldn't, and not like he wouldn't get out of the car, but he was like kind of taking a second. And I said, Hey but buddy, what's up? He goes, dad, I'm really nervous. He started to choke up a little bit. And I said, I said, what's going on? But I mean, we, we've practiced these songs and like, you know, the parts and you wrote some of the stuff. So it should be great. And he goes, dad, this is like, it's like your job. What if I blow it? I mean, I didn't tell him, like, I don't, I haven't made money on music for decades, kid. So don't worry about it. <laughs> I didn't get into that part. <laughs> like, I know it's my job. It's just, no one's listening. Uh, like, <laughs> it doesn't sell. You don't understand. I didn't say that part. What I said was, I said, dude, uh, yeah, it is my job. And it, it does. It matters a lot to me. But here's the thing. Like, you, you we're going to go in there and you're going to record a little bit and you're going to get some stuff wrong. You're going to miss notes and then we're going to fix it um, because that's what we do and I do it is I miss notes and then I fix it. But it's not going to be about that. It's You've done everything right by just being here because what I really want is I just want to make, I want to make music with you. And so like we're, you, we're every, we're, we've done all that needs to be done by just showing up together and everything else from here, everything else here is, is cake. And I totally meant it. I mean, the reality is, is like if I, if I wanted if I wanted excellence in all areas and if it was always entirely about execution, like I'm the, I've been the, <laughs> I've been the weak link musically on every record I've ever done. Like I'm the lesser, I'm the lesser of all musicians on every record I've ever made. Um, but I'm there with me to do it. And so I got to say to my son, I'm here with you because this is what I want. I want to do this with you. Um, I was in tears, of course, when I said it, and I was like this blubbering mess, and he got embarrassed uh, for me because I was crying in front of him. But like, I didn't, I don't get to go back in time and like wish my dad had done that for me, but I got to do that for my son because reality is like, yeah, like he's a kid at the time. He's like eleven years old. Is he a great piano player? No, um, but I don't care. I just wanted to be there with him. That moment with my dad could have been that moment where he was like, hey, what matters to me is that you and I get to do this together. And it became about execution because he got his identity caught up in the results of his work as opposed to his work being an expression of his identity in which I got to share. Hmm. Now, the thing that I, I think as you, as you keep moving through uh, the story, one of the things you say here is, that regardless of your specific job, it's the love you experience and pass on that matters. So when the particular job ends or the work focus shifts or our abilities evolve and change, we still get to go on loving people with our time and talent. And I think that's yeah. 
that's kind of where you're you're landing here is of just yep. like how how we do the thing is just as important of as where we end up and i think that's that's a without like, question like the idea of well the ends justify the means i don't agree with that in an art sense um no. because because I, I it's so funny that out here talking with my kids who are now starting to launch and uh, they're going into music and they're doing um a, lo a lot and i'm like what's the number one rule and they're like don't be a butthole and I'm like, that's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. Because it is funny how, right. how that gets tolerated. Like you're a jerk, but you're a genius, so it's fine. Yes. And and there is a there. I don't know. I don't know where the where the line is on that because on some things it's like, yep, I'll I'll deal with it. But on other yep. things, like I I always hear people talk about with TV, um, with a movie, yeah. it's like, yeah, you'll deal with a jerk because you're only shooting for four to six weeks it's no big deal but tv it's like this could be five years so yeah. this person can't be a jerk for five years because it's just not mm -hmm. going to work or why do no. why do we always see certain teams always working together um or yeah. certain actors and and directors yep. uh, working together and i think that that has a lot to it so what is your do you, i mean is there a number one rule that you you tend to uh ascribe to yeah um the that it's about <laughs> The number one rule is it's not, I guess, not like a rule rule, although I like the don't be a butthole rule. I like that a lot. Um, it, it's about chasing, ch chasing yourself and chasing your joy. So the way I'll, the way I, I, I coach it is I talk about really specifically, like make joy, make joy a metric, if not your primary metric, not, which is not to say like all, nothing else matters. I think does the project sell? Can we, you know, like that's a, numbers, numerical stuff that definitely matters in the long run though. Um, if joy isn't your metric, uh, you won't keep doing the work. You'll burn out. And if joy isn't your metric, you'll make lesser work anyways. So my, my, my number one rule, if I have a number one, number one rule when it comes to art and execution is make it about the joy, make it about joy, make joy your primary. Am I enjoying myself? Am I loving this thing? Do I feel alive in it? It's kind of a practice of examine there. Like, am I? Do I feel alive and present to this work? Make that your metric, and I, I'm pretty sure if you do that, everything else either automatically follows or it follows a lot more easily. Yeah, and so like I guess with a with where this comes into um belovedness like what we talked about last week of like the state of being and 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 who it is um you, you talk about regardless of your job job you're invited to love the world around you and the people in it not because you're useful you're invited because you're loved and so yes. when when we talk about how this interacts with with a creator and um and having been created mm -hmm. like it really does take a different tone because i feel like a lot of art is very self it's very yeah. self because we think about ourselves first. Like, okay, so yeah. I'm going to create this thing and I'm going to do yeah. a thing and here's my identity. And we, yeah. we just run through the, the last 30 minutes. Like these are all the things that we think about. Um, this is kind of strange, I think, in terms of yeah. like um, that we're, in, we're, we're invited to love the world around us and the people in it. Okay, but by by doing the thing, I guess that's just like a, a secondary thought, honestly. Like if, if I'm the just thing? really... Yeah, like a, like the yeah. idea that I'm loving the world around me and people like I guess like I don't the I don't project think of that. is the, the project is secondary, regardless yeah. of the project. Which that's that's very odd to me. Like even if I just think of yeah. my own creativeness. Yeah, totally. The project is secondary. It won't outlast relationship, and everything we build, which is you know lit, we'll get to later on in the book. Like everything, everything falls apart eventually. Um. Like you, we don't get to build things at last. We d this is just not an option. Um, this the project, whether it's the book, the podcast, the nation state, um, it's always secondary. It's always secondary. The primary thing is, are we loving the people around us in the way that we've been loved? That's it. That's quite literally everything. Am I loving people because I've been loved? That's everything. Every, and everything that isn't that, it's not unimportant. It's just less important. And its importance is predicated on how important it is to love one another the way we've been loved. Everything else is secondary to that. Mm. Okay. Well, 
That's a good note to end on. Yeah, yeah. What do you what do we take away from there? Um, you should probably read the book. I oh, think if you cool. haven't yet, it's a pretty good that's a that's a good next step. Well, especially because uh, it keeps going in. on sale off sale right now, which we should it tell does. everyone about. It's been on sale. It, it actually does. Off sale. Well, I, and I don't know exactly how the algorithm works, but I know that when people start paying attention to something online, the algorithm says, oh, I can sell more of this. And um, so it tends to kind of lower the price. So um, one, actually a couple of things I'd love for folks to do. One is if you haven't picked the book up, um, I'd love you to do it. I, I read it. Um, that was a lot of fun. So I feel like audiobooks. it's me talking for a solid four hours. Maybe you can't handle that. We'll find out. Um, and if you did read it and you enjoyed it, um, a review would make a big difference. I think we're at like 23 or 24 reviews. We've sold way more books than that. So if you've read the book, I'd love for you to tell some people you, you, you dug it. So that's some that's some stuff I'd like to I'd love for folks to do as well. But there you go. Dan, thank you. Yeah, sure. No problem. Good times. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the At Sea Podcast. On behalf of your co-host and producer, Dan Portnoy, this is Justin McRoberts signing off. Until next time.